Ready to go. Good morning, everyone. This is Friday, February 16th, 2024, meeting of the Nantucket Historical Commission. Um, let me begin by taking attendance. Let's start with those who are in the trailer. I um, see Rita Carr. Hi. Good morning. Uh, and Clement Darkus. Hi. Hi. I'm here. And um, Holly, thank you for Hi. holding the meeting here. And uh, online, we have Abby Demolina. Hi. Good morning. Uh, Mickey Rowland. Here. Tom Montgomery. Here. And do we have anyone else? Is it just me? You. So I'm remote as well. Um, all right. I'm going to apologize in, in uh, ahead of the meeting for any sort of blowing or drinking or <laughs> sniffling. I've I've been um, I've had a little bit of flu, so I'm going to manage best I can. Um, all right, uh, are there? I'm not seeing any members of the public, so um, and unless unless anyone has a oh I'm I'm seeing. I'm seeing some some other people here. Uh, Eric Reese. Hi. 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 How are you? Um, thank you for joining. And I see Mike Burns and Hillary Rayport. Thank you all for joining. Is there any um, uh, public comment? And this would be on things that aren't on the agenda. Um, hearing none, we can move on to the first item which is our staff update um let's start with the demo delay update thank you mr chair so um as you probably all are aware the demo delay um proposal that i've um tried to put forward um is not on the warrant um and i will take responsibility of that um that was something that i did not follow through with fellow staff um but um i'm getting i got some direction and um, hopefully we can have it, I can work on it more with the planning director and get it on for next year. And I apologize on that, but as you know, um, it's a busy town. So that's all I ask for your understanding on that. Um, learning curve for me, not as simple as the, um, the one that I did for <laughs> the uh, aprons a couple of years ago. So there's that. Holly, you had thought that that was going to be a housekeeping issue and wouldn't necessitate going on the warrant. It was well, no, it would be on the warrant regardless. But I did think it was going to be a housekeeping. It was. It was. It's at the end of the day, it was my assumption, um, and there was a little dis miscommunication on my end. So again, I will take fault on that. It's not going to be obviously. It's not on the warrant, um, and we're going to be working on it to get it on for next year. So again. Thank um, you. Do you. Do you anticipate there might be a special town meeting and maybe we could have it on that? If there is, there? I would love to have it on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would have to be flushed out more, but yes. Okay. Yes. The next. That's why I say the next yeah. one, whatever it is. But yeah. So it is on the the planning director's list of potential. So um, and it was on it before. It just needed to be fleshed out. And you know, so there's that. Um, I did want to, oh, um, so the next topic is the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. You all know that that's, what, that's been long due and pending, um, that it's going to be before the select board and uh, the HDC for their final report next week. So um, tune in if, if you're interested in that. Um, it's supposed to be first right at the beginning of the select board's uh, meeting. So I'm, you know, the, you know how passionate I am about Having NAPC, they're the subject matter experts. They are the professionals. Um, and they're doing this for over 40 years with different qualifications um, all around the country. So they, I'm, I'm really excited um, for their uh, recommendations for the town. Um, so there's that. It's uh, February 21st. Um, Holly, should, and related to that, should we call a, a meeting? Because I... Um... I, I, I mean, probably a number of us who are going to be interested in attending. If you're, if there's going to be a quorum, then yeah, um, I, I would have to post a meeting, but I, 
quite frankly, you know, if you're going to be sitting and in, and in, in watching it on um, on YouTube or Zoom, it's not really necessary. You're not going to be calling a meeting. Okay. Right. You're so not going to be we'll deliberating. Be um, and no one's making any kind of and, and this commission is not making any comment. So okay. I would, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't think it's necessary. Okay. All right. Um, and then CPC, as you all are Community Preservation Commission, so you all know that we had discussed on submitting for um, those applications. Those have been vetted. Those are on the town warrant. They got, um, that's a whole process all in with itself, let me tell you. I know Rita's been involved with CPC for, for MPT. Um, and so they're Basically, they they have multiple meetings after they actually have the applicant. But long story short, it's on the warrant. It's they they've the two projects that we are um, in in um, joint uh, with Penn Preservation Institute in Nantucket, the University of Florida is the Main Street sidewalk um, rehab project continuation of the one that MPT and Penn did um, a couple of years ago. And then, and that's going to be really, um, I'm really excited about that one. And then another great one is the West Montemoy and doing that extensive. Um, I do kind of have an update on that. Um, I was in a Zoom meeting with UMass and um, the University of Florida's Historic Preservation Program um, about the West Montemoy CPC project. Um, and I can tell you that um, we also had a couple other um, Nantucketers in that, and Marsha Vader was there, um, and really talking about bringing in um, what the other universities have been working on. So basically, from an education perspective, and how that's going to help facilitate and incorporate into the assessment, because again, this project is to be the um, the assessment of the historic cultural resources before they even get to doing the the detailed um, form Bs or form As or whatever we are actually going to have within the West Montemoy area. But it was really, really exciting collaborating all the theses that have been done over the years, but with both those universities specifically for that area and actually including archaeology. So very, very cool um, to work on. So I wanted to give you all that update. Hey, Holly, could you could you elaborate exactly what is the West Montemoy area? So the West Montemoy area from our um, Historic Cultural Resource Survey Plan that we had approved um, is basically a five corners area, Newtown. That very culturally rich um, neighborhood that is, um, you know, there we, we know we, ha we have only a handful of structures that are surveyed in that area. Um, there's what, maybe the, the African Meeting House, the Higginbottom House, and probably if you look at the... Um, Matt Fee's building are probably the only three that have mm -hmm. any type of documentation and or preservation restriction attached to it. 55 Union, I think. And 55. I think, I think you're right. I think it's on the border. But yeah, so that's that neighborhood, if you remember on the on the survey plan. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the um, offshore wind uh, grant community fund um, that you all know, know about um, with our good neighbor agreement um, due to the section 106 review process for um, vineyard wind. Um, so you all know that there are different buckets, there's town buckets, there's community buckets of, of funding that this goes through. And um, we had discussed using money for um, education we're doing a video um, based on building with Nantucket in mind and kind of assisting the HDC on getting those best management practices out there. And after talking with the town's um, public outreach manager, um, Florencia, she said that's something that we can do in-house. So we don't necessarily need to have funding. We don't necessarily need, um, we're not looking at the end of the day, this commission is not looking for something robust like the cemetery commission. Um, where they're actually wanting to have a documentation and, and a documentary of um, Fran uh, Cartoonin and um, our former NHC member um, and my former history teacher, uh, Barbara White, 
Um, and and I, on that note, they did put an application in, and I actually wrote a letter of support for them on that project. I thought it was very important to give that preservation um, bucket, if you will, of support. So they did receive a letter of, of support for their application. Uh, I hope to see that one through. And then I believe there was another video, um, I think that the uh, Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee is also working on that they put in. I think the town put in quite a bit of applications from the town bu bucket. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but again, I think that gives a, this commission time and um, I would recommend maybe, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Rita, but this was something I know you were one kind of spearheading um, to maybe have a, a, a subcommittee of this commission, a couple members to go over what exactly um, from building Nantucket in mind that you want to assist with. Oh, on, on that note, and I apologize, I don't think I was at that meeting um, at the HDC. No, I think I was I was wow. sick. Um, but the HDC did vote, or well, they, they did discuss and, and had unanimous support of um, this commission assisting in creating that education video. So that's good news. That's what I wanted to see. I want a collaboration between the two of you as CLG. Um, and you know, you all have the time and effort and energy to be able to help facilitate the those what's already in the best management practices, our building with Nantucket in mind and and assisting the public and, and saying, you know, and I know Mickey and, and Angus can both as they see some of these applications um on a weekly basis when they look at stuff and Rita, I think and Mary. Um, but really and truly those those functions of building one Nantucket in mind, but specifically you guys were talking about the solar. Solar is very important. It's been a big topic for the last couple of years. So with that, um, that's where that stands. Thank you, Holly. Mm -hmm. um, any comments from the commissioners? Uh, hearing none, let's go on to the ongoing historic resources survey work. Yes. Um, so uh, start with the physical 2023 update on requests for qualifications. So that one is um, in the works um, after having a joint meeting with um, MHC and finance. Um, I believe I've met, informed the commission that um, we were having difficulty um, securing uh, qualified architectural historians that meet the criteria. Um, and from talking to um, um, Mr. Steinitz at MHC, uh, the pool for that is, is there's more work out there in the state um, than there are uh, qualified professionals. So what that means is in order for us to move forward with fiscal 23, um, we're gonna be revising the RFQ um, and making it a little bit um, less stringent, if you will. We did have another um, applicant that submitted, um, or a vendor that submitted a proposal on it between, that I found out between the last time we met and this time. And um, they were way out of state, never had any Massachusetts qualifications. And MHC said, no, <laughs> we appreciate your interest, but no. So um, our procurement department has um, notified that applicant. Um, so yes, yeah, so, but I'm kind of in a way back to the drawing board, but like I said, I will be working with um, town finance director as well as um, MHC to take those specific sections and um, make it a little less restrictive. Um, so hopefully we can get somebody that can um, meet those qualifications and and move forward on that. This well, yeah. recommendations did um, Mass Historical offer for us to be able to make better use of the yeah. resources that are available to us. So I had asked the methodology that they gave us back in 2021 when we first started the survey plan and the pilot for the fish lots. Um, they said a $40,000 project, which is a 20 and 20, um, is approximately 140 surveys. Well, as we all know, there is this thing called the Nantucket factor. <laughs> and I will tell you from working with other state agencies, um, that that's really hard for them to understand. 
um, trying to justify why a consultant needs to come to Nantucket for more than a day and have to stay in, you know, a bed and breakfast um, and, and why it costs more than staying at a 7-Eleven. Um, so my point is, you all know, there's an Nantucket factor that really is not taken into consideration. So from talking with even our current consultant um you know there's a there's a a cost factor that unfortunately has not been baked into the amount of funding um and so that again is is of concern um it sounds like that they're willing to work a little bit with that but not by much it's going to be um the the amount of applications um excuse me the amount of surveys that we are um going to be doing. It might go down from 140 to maybe 120 or maybe 100 um, to be able to, you know, inflate, if you will, the cost for each survey. But again, it's also going to be dependent on, as you see, the list that we have before us for fiscal 23. Some of these are, old, you know, old um, 89 surveys, as I like to call them, that are recorded at MHC um, and from Macris that you know, some of them may not even reflect the current condition of the structure, may not be even be there. It may even been moved. You know, again, that's that's kind of the the um, part of um, the work that the, the architectural historians will be doing along with my assistant. So um, this list that we have here that we've put in the previous two RFQs for this fiscal year project um, is is what we have 130 of them. So this might get dwindled. Um, I haven't received one after I sent this out to you all. I didn't receive anybody's yay, nay, and or indifferent. Um, so I'm assuming this is what we can move forward with with this next uh, fiscal year. And we have like wiggle room, if you will, if if while they're out in the field, if there if there's something like we've had in the past, you know, hey, we look at this property and it's it's really 1980s, and you know, it's not. Let's take it off the list. Boom, we're going to do this one instead. Great. So. So do you think it's a, a more of a question of paying them more, trying to get a bigger? It's it's a, the availability okay. is really. I mean, how many how many different organizations are we looking at? Not many. At? Well, I would know. Um, so when five? we when we yeah, there's a, probably about a half a dozen of them. G good news is I do I did reach out with MHC's assistance um, or recommendation um, to a couple that were on the list that. Um, expressed interest before um, mm -hmm. to see if they had any availability in time with their current projects. And it seemed like that that there was um, interest mm -hmm. and please keep me posted. So oh, okay. I, I am oh. confident that we'll get somebody at the end of their current project mm -hmm. that will be able to tie it in. It's all about timing, obviously. Um, but again, you know, we're we're not going to get probably somebody that either doesn't, you know, we're going to have to be flexible in the requirements, not necessarily somebody, because before we were wanting to have Nantucket experience, Nantucket experience. Um, that's going to have to go away. We're going to have to open up the, you know, so there's things like that, that the re requirements that are going to be mm -hmm. tweaked. And again, I have to make sure that both procurement and MHC are satisfied. So that's what I'm working on. I'm also wondering about just the resources that have already presented themselves and people who are already doing the work. I think about like Betsy Tyler and, and mm -hmm. Marsha Fader and the work that they've done for the Sconset Trust. I'm yep. thinking about MPT who's, you know, they've, they've done surveys um, yep. and, and it's, um, you know, now, now we're, you know, luckily getting help with the West Monomoy um, in that collaboration between the town and, and uh, Penn. Um, so I'm, you know, it'd be great, even if people can't do all of it, maybe we, if, if we can spread it around and, you know, have different, Shipboard. if, is that something that, that you could approach MHC with? Um, we did discuss the fact that we have subject matter experts, uh, architectural historians on Nantucket, and, you know, that would be very helpful if, if we could have the, uh, pri the, recommend sorry I'm, my brain is fried <laughs> um if we could revise the rfq requirements to be less restrictive so for instance for those that haven't really haven't seen the rfq there are requirements within the boilerplate 
um, RFQ that requires you to have X amount of, of um, prior experience. So outside of Nantucket. Oh. Right. Like five different locations. Okay. Five, Even though know. we're asking you to do Correct. something. Correct. So those are the, like, the, I'm not the, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting in the weeds here, but yeah, yeah, those yeah. are the type of things that we're going to be looking at in the RFQ to um, lessen the restriction, if you will. Mm -hmm. is, does that does that make sense? So hopefully we can move in a in a positive direction. That would be a win win um, if we could do that. So if he needs what. to keep the Nantucket factor on Nantucket, <laughs> right, right. We I trust me. I have explained to MHC. You know, we we have great subject matter experts here already. We wouldn't have to tie in the Nantucket factor. So you know, how can we do this to make this work? So um, again, uh, we'll be revising lessening up the restrictions and um, getting it back out there, soliciting bids and moving forward. Um, just a, a note about the um, that latest list that's on the on the screen now. Um, I've looked at a number of those um, and it'll be exciting to get surveys of of those. There are some that did catch my eye and and made me wonder, you know, has this been reconstructed? Okay. And so, um, yeah, we, uh, I, I think others have been doing that. We just haven't organized getting back to you. Yeah, I would love that, Mr. Chair. If we, we can get a, you know, if it, looking at this list, um, there's some of you, I think that um, know more of these buildings than others. Uh, give me your, your, your real um, truth on it. But again, I also will, will say that having it on the list doesn't hurt Again, these are a, a preliminary target list, um, and we do have it baked in here. Where if the whoever the consultant is um, realizes, you know what, this building over here, we have a old survey on it, but it's not the same. Then again, like I've mentioned before, I'm gonna we're gonna be taking that off. I'm gonna put it on the list of stuff that I'm going to be um, doing for um, continuation. Oh, and on that note, I'm sorry. If, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, I want to kind of bring back the, it ties in with the survey work, but it also ties in with the last discussion of the offshore wind. Um, I put in an application for the commission for survey work. Mm -hmm. So we could get more money in addition to- It would, no, it would be a little specific. Um, it was geared towards having funding available for that particular work I just mentioned. So- Oh, these, that's sick. So, so these continuation ones where mm -hmm. we can't have our consultant do it because it's taking time and effort and money out of the actual very prescriptive federal funding that we get, mm -hmm. you know, it's allocated mm -hmm. through Congress to the SHPO down to this, you know, to us. Um, as well as this would allow us to, spe to specifically survey our um town owned historic resources oh, as you know we've put in our survey plan and as you know we have um been growing some of them as well um so um this is exciting and hopefully i'm 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 hopeful that they'll that, be great yeah idea. so i did do that um by myself but on behalf of obviously the clg so Thank sorry you. i forgot about bringing that up well, that's good because nobody's touched that yet. <laughs> so so there's simple. there's that. But yes, Mr. Chair, if you if you um if you have specific ones in mind that are on this list, please send it to me because that way um I can revise it in time and send it with the revised RFQ. I kept thinking it's easier to um to take off than add on, but um yep. yes, we will do that. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Um, and what about the application for fiscal year, fiscal year, uh, 2024? So with the fact that we are in this limbo right now with fiscal 23, um, it was decided, um, by my, by me and talking to town administration that we would not move forward to fiscal 24 because, um, again, we're kind of in this bucket of, we have a current contract with the state right now, and we don't have a con, we don't have a consultant. So let's focus our efforts on this section. 
Um, MHC is, is aware um, and they obviously want us to apply again. I will, I sincerely apologize to the commission, um, but I hope you understand that it, it's just, it's not, it's not feasible of having two different, and actually at that point we would have three different contracts out for three different fiscal year projects. It's a little cumbersome, especially where the fact that your staff liaison um, has other duties as assigned. So um, this isn't at the end of the road. Again, we're still doing survey work. We're still collaborating with, you know, um, Sconset Trust, MPT, PIN. Um, we're doing good things for the surveys. Um, and, you know, hopefully the grant um, from the wind farm will, will also be provided to us to, and not be so restrictive. That's really hard. I don't know if the commission really understands that. The federal funding, it's great that this the Congress allocates a certain amount of money every fiscal year, and all the SHPOs are required to provide 10% of that federal funding to CLGs. And yeah, we're now a CLG, which is great. Um, and that's, you know, obviously something that I've been near and dear to my heart since I was a teenager. We're there, and the, and the pool is getting bigger because they're adding more CLGs. Um, but... This state is is very, very happy seeing us there and seeing us applying. So I don't see this as as a, you know, a, necessarily a bad thing. We're still surveying. That's the, the the utmost importance, I think, for everybody to 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 get. So I hope I really do hope you all understand um, the decision to not move forward with another fiscal year project and be in another boat with not having um a, a consultant to, to move forward with this will also MHC understands that too though i believe so, so. Well, yes because we've asked to reduce yes. the criteria yes and so so i mean because that was kind of brought up when we we met you know they knew that that was that was pending well, hopefully we'll be going back for oh yes definitely yeah. um yeah yeah there's yeah. nothing that would prevent no that, that was nothing that would, no and, and nothing, nothing that all. would say oh you right. stopped so Right. And that was one thing, you know, the, 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 the MHC realizes how cumbersome these things are. Um, and we were so they're just, role, it seemed like they're just, well, yeah. And unfortunately the, the, the pool of qualified consultants have, has gone down. They're busy. Everybody's understaffed. I think <laughs> that's one thing that I think the world is understaffed. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just something that, you know, is understood. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Holly. Um, Hillary, did you have your hand up? Oh, thanks. I did, but I think Clement um, asked the question that I was going to ask, which is just, you know, of course, the other thing you get when you go through the MHC is um, you get their advice and you get their um, mm -hmm. collaboration and their standards because mm -hmm. um, it's been hard to fill this because they have standards and standards are there for a reason. But I think everybody's aware of that. It just may be that um, more will fall to Holly because she's going to have to fill in if there's a less qualified person. Um, that's the only thing I wanted to mention. But I understand, you know, if people aren't applying, there's only so much you can do. Right. Right. Well, I, I feel like we have um, we've had such great momentum, which has been so encouraging and such important work. Um, and so I think my only lament is, is that I feel like we're losing momentum a little bit. But but, um, you know, it it might be a little bit in fits and starts to to get back um, back in the rhythm again. And so we'll do that as soon as we can. But we've got the steps, you know, I mean, the steps are in place. Oh, yeah, the methodology as, is there. Yeah, exactly. um, and I will, you know, that's one thing that um, PIN is aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's good with the work that they're going to be doing with the, the, um, West Monomoy, um, and collaboration, you know, and again, they're just doing the cultural resource assessments, kind of getting all that stuff together. Um, and, and they'll hopefully they'll be applying for another, um, CPC for the next phase. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we're, I know it seems like we were such on, on good momentum and I was really bummed that. Pal, Pal is understaffed. They were really, you know, upset about not being able to continue. They, 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 they're happy that they're the ones that helped us create our survey plan and do the pilot and establish the. I mean, they fix, they fix, they, they create, they took our our twenty twenty or twenty twelve 
National Historic Landmark um, update um, and all 350 pages of the Excel spreadsheet revised it so it was that the data was utilized to be able to create our survey plan so we have actual you know numbers when it comes to understanding our our neighborhoods um, and what is contributing what's not um, and it's very very important and from for so many yeah. so many things so yes so thank you on that um all right well if there's nothing more about uh, the surveys, then let's move on to the um, the 106 review of um, the milestone pulpus intersection. Um, I think uh, I think probably the best thing to do is maybe just start with either um, Eric, do you want to just open this up and and just give us a uh, an update on where we are and um, thank you guys so much for writing the letter. I don't know. Um, I don't know who ended up with it or why we didn't get it, but um, thank you for for um, for writing that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've, no, I'm not sure either <laughs> where that where the mix up happened um, with receiving the letter. So I'm glad you guys were able to receive it. Um, as far as an update, right now we're working on the next submission. Uh, for this project, which would be the 100% design submission. Uh, we're looking to submit that to MassDOT actually next week. Um, based on that, we should still be on schedule for an advertisement date that would be uh, mid to end of June. So I, probably a few months after that, my guess would be September, there would actually be uh, a contractor awarded, awarded the contract to start construction. So this will be a summer project then. It will be going on over the summer. Uh, it's, it, the, during the summer is when they would uh, be advertising the project, um, getting bids from contractors, and then probably choosing. It usually takes about three months to actually pick a contractor. So work most likely wouldn't begin until after Labor Day. Um, okay, good. That's probably best anyway. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Traffic. We have a... a a narrow window of very intense traffic. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may. Holly, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I did want to, so, you know, my understanding um, when the letters from GPI got sent out, we were not the only commission board, what have you, that didn't receive it. So I want everybody to realize that, that there's, you know, I didn't receive it. it no idea. Um, with that said, we have since received it. So thank you. Um, but I did also want to mention that I did bring up to um, GPI's attention that um, in the cultural resource um, project record, there was this um, mention of um, the historic district and mentioning that it was not in the local district. And I have clarified and corrected that, that it might not be in the 1955 old historic district of town, but that the entire island is a local and national district, and it, it, it is in the historic district. Um, I also do want to remind the commission of what your purview is um, it, under basically section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And with that, there are cultural resources. You know, again, our cultural resources are anything that's built between 19, excuse me, 1659, when we were created as a, 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 a town, um, through um, 1975. Um, so there are structures that are built in the mid-century, mid 1950s, 60s, that are in the, what I would call the area of potential effect, APE. Um, which I do believe I did ask that as well. So I just wanted to preface our discussion with all of that information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Holly, I so appreciate you um, writing that letter and um, and explaining that um, to GPI. Thank you. Um, there, there's also, you know, not just the the structures, but the, you know, the roads and the settings, which were you know, obligated to review and, um, you know make recommendations to to maintain um the setting as much as as possible on this historic landmark um so um are there are there any questions um i 
Hillary, I see you're on here and you've done so much research about this. Are there any um, are there any uh, points or or um, short history or anything that you feel would be helpful to the commission? Oh, um, sure. Thank you for calling on me, Angus. I mean, I from from my um, experience and the work that I did in the past on the previous project in, involving Milestone Road, I think um, the the road itself is a historic road. Um, we did. This commission did work um, on the research. We received a report from Mary Bergman and Nantucket Preservation Trust on the history of the road. Um, and the, um, the community um, has also observed the interest in having the roads be at a certain scale um, for historic preservation purposes. Um, and that's in a, a bylaw, I think it's, 127. I don't remember the name of the bylaw, but it's called um, Limits on Road Construction. And the specific language is about in order to preserve the historic setting. So, you know, I, I think it's 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 complicated and um, there's it's an accepted truth in landscape studies that roads and highways are part of the cultural landscape that we live in. They um, contribute to, they shape the way we perceive our landscape and they shape it, our behaviors. Um, so there's a long, you know, a long scholarly basis of reason to be attentive to the roads, the highways. And there's um, a long history of, uh, of adverse outcomes on cultural resources, which is why this commission is being asked to weigh in and why. Um, the DOT actually maintains its own cultural resources unit that liaises directly with the state historic preservation officer, um, who also liaises with local preservation commissions like this one. So, so I think there's um, a real basis for the discussion. Um, I think there is a basis for considering the road to be a historic road. I think there is a basis for considering the community's wishes um, for reasons of um, tourism and the scenic distinctive quality of Nantucket to have the road be not having turning lanes. Um, and I think the downside of that would be more traffic moving more slowly, not more traffic, but traffic moving more slowly. Um, and I'm not sure that that necessarily makes things less safe. I think slower traffic um, is actually a contributor to fewer, less harmful crashes. Um, so I thank you, Angus. I mean, I have looked at it a lot and shared my thoughts and I'm happy to share more thoughts, but those are my initial reactions. Thanks, Hillary. Um, commissioners, any questions or, or comments for? I have so many questions, but, um, cause I know we're trying, it has been deemed that T stops are safer than the Y, the turn off lanes and everything else. Um, and just to just fully disclose, they're doing this in front of my house in Sconset, where the little triangle is. The triangle has is disappearing, and we're going to have a turn lane off uh, uh, Sankety Road onto Coffin Street. They're putting in a turn lane, so it'll be the same. And and they've already done it at Washington and whatever that intersection is, you know, Francis. Francis. Um, so that's a turn line. So I'm I'm concerned about what signage is going to go up, um, what curbing is going to go up. I had a whole list of things I was looking at this morning, and now I left my notes at home. But all kinds of you know those things I couldn't really I I saw the signage. So are they putting stop signs in? Are they putting more? Um, they talked about high intensity. Is it going to be that same orangey, yellowy that's on Milestone Road? Uh, they talked about a lot of signage painted on the road, like, you know, turn right only, turn left only. And then at some place they had, um, it indicated that it was going to be a yellow plastic bump in the road that was going to say, you know, left turn only. Um, that would be coming out from town and then trying to, and then 
attempting to turn onto pulpus. Um, my other questions were on milestone. We've got so many of those signs that say crosswalk ahead and then the crosswalk. And those two signs are very close together. So if you're coming down milestone and turning onto pulpus, are we getting those crosswalk ahead, crosswalk signs for those people making the right-hand turn? Because they're going to be crossing the bike path and the and the walking path very quickly after they make that turn. Um, so um, I, I assume... A lot. Eric, are you... I was trying to keep track of uh, the, the yeah. questions. I, I can definitely talk through some of our thoughts. Um, oh, good. So as far as additional signage, uh, we are proposing a total of five signs. And of those five, I, I believe, you know, uh, two or three of them are simply replacing signs that are already there. Uh, I did work on the project for when Monomoy uh, Road and Tom Nevers Road uh, were realigned as well. And I definitely learned a lot with that project on kind of how to treat signs for Nantucket in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we definitely even pushed back on some reviews from MassDOT to add additional signs because we're like, no, we don't deem these necessary. Uh, for any signs that we have proposed, it's either the, um, the federal manual uh, mandates them or we felt it's just a, a safety concern uh, either for drivers or for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so the only signs right now that we're proposing are uh, there's a one speed limit sign. Um, there is a left lane must turn left uh, from the milestone road turn lane. There is a sign to show uh, on Pulpus Road, right lane is for right turning, left lane is for left turning. Um, and there is a uh, do not pass sign uh, that we're replacing. Um, and then I believe we're also just replacing the arrow for the sign that goes with the hospital sign that's there today. Um, those are the only signs we are proposing. Uh, as far as how reflective they are, that, that's a federal standard. Uh, so we just call out to meet what the federal standard is. Um, we don't have any orange signs proposed. They're all just standard black and white signs. So we aren't adding any additional color in that sense. Uh, as far as pavement markings, we do propose the, the arrows and the only in the lanes that are turning lanes. Um, outside of that, it is just your traditional, you know, two yellow lines in the center and then shoulder lines. Mm -hmm. um, did I miss any concerns, questions? No, I, that's good on the signs. I like that so far. Um, but I mean, there's some going to be, I mean, the yellow lane that's going to be in the middle of Milestone Road, that's where you'll delineate. That'll be on the ground and just painted like, you know, the yellow double line. Yes, so which is similar to what's just out there today. We will be widening and just restriping that double yellow line. Um, what about the curb, Eric? Curbing is, oh yes, thank you. Uh, the curbing is just shown as berm. It's just yes. your standard berm that's uh, along kind of throughout the rest of the area. Uh, we aren't putting any granite curb or anything like that up. And so the the median between um, uh, the, two, the, the, the two lanes and the one lane on the pulpus at the crosswalk, all of that is flush with, with the pavement? Correct. That was that design is the exact same one that was put at, at Monomoy Road and Tom Nevers Road. Mm -hmm. So it is a it's a it's flush with the road. It is uh, granite rubble blocks. Um, there is some granite curb that's into the road that just holds those stones in place so they don't pop out. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, we have a hand raised. Oh, Erica, welcome. Please Hi, go ahead. Thanks. Um, regarding the the kind of flush areas within the you know next to the turning lanes, we had a lot of discussions about those in the planning stages for this. Um, personally, I wanted to make sure that house moves could happen through there, and that yeah. we didn't have raised curbs to have to go up over because, yeah. as everybody knows, the select board 
is in favor of recycled houses. Um, and so whenever we're doing you know, intersection restructuring like this, that's one of the first questions I always tend to ask, can we get houses through there? Um, Island Lumber is right there. They get 18 wheel, you know, 18 wheeler deliveries almost every day. Um, can an 18 wheeler get through there? Um, and, so, you know, so in order to make sure that those can happen, you know, we did try to make it as, as flush as possible. Um, and uh, one thing, um, is it Clement that said about the crosswalk signs? Um, I just want to, as a, on a personal note, um, I appreciate the crosswalk ahead signage because, um, you don't always know they're right there and then you've got somebody crossing and you're not expecting them. Um, and we have so many drivers that aren't from here and to give them a heads up that a crosswalk is coming, I think is so important to give, you know, the people that are crossing an opportunity, you know, for the people that are driving to know that a crosswalk is coming up and they have to be careful. Is there room in there to do a crosswalk ahead when you're making that turn from I mean, it doesn't uh, even milestone on to pulpus? We, we we don't propose those signs when you're turning. So that for that for a crosswalk on pulpus, there would not be a crosswalk ahead sign. Uh, it'd be more for if there's a crosswalk on the road you're already traveling on. So and I, uh, I assume you'll have uh, stop signs for the bike path. Um, I don't know. Don't, I don't remember if we actually proposed that. I don't think we proposed that for this location. We did on um when we restriped Milestone Road a few years back. Um. For this one, we did not propose stop signs for the bikes. The cars have a stop sign. Mike Burns might want to talk on this, I think. <laughs> Mike, yeah, please go ahead. Love the input. <laughs> yeah, the uh, is, can you hear me okay? I'm having issues with uh, microphones and stuff this morning. If you can hear me, I'll just say that uh, the community had passed a bylaw a couple of years ago to kind of remove stop signs for the uh, path approaches to uh, intersections. Um, so that's something we're trying to get away from. And I believe there's effort at the state level to actually uh, not term these as crosswalks, but rather term those as crossings and that give protections to bicyclists and pedestrians within the, the crosswalk. And that's at least where the local sentiment is, is to give protections for all users and not prohibit any from uh, from using the crossing. Um, so this is, I think we're just putting that into practice now and it seems to be uh, acceptable by the state. I would say that's standard practice. We don't usually propose a stop sign for pedestrians and bicyclists to cross the road. Um, well, so I think yeah. there is one at Tom Nevers, as I recall. We did put them in with that with that project. Uh, we've definitely, we've gotten and, away from that practice. And there uh, is actually a, a movement, oh, yeah. I think, underway to eliminate those stop signs at bike paths. Well, I know they're considered kind of nuisance signs because they're up there. Well, it's and, not and, about the sign being a nuisance. It's about it doesn't comply with the bylaw. Well, it seems to me that if you are a driver and you're turning the right onto Tom Nevers Road, you assume that the bikers are going to stop because they have a stop sign. But they don't. But they don't. So, I, yeah, I don't know. Just because there's a stop sign there doesn't mean they're going to do it. So you, you got to be careful. Because I think it's all about safety. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Hillary? So there will be a stop sign, though, at the end of Pulpit Road, where you have the to vehicles go. vehicles will have a stop sign. Both of those lanes will have a stop sign. And that's the only one at that intersection. Correct. There'll be one stop sign for Pulpit Road for both those lanes, and that would be the only stop sign. Mr. Chair, I have a question, if that's OK. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, probably to Eric, um, and I I know that the select board has um, uh, basically approved concept three. Um, as somebody who um, drives Pulpus Road uh, more sometimes more than twice a day, as I lived on it for over thirty years, I am very happy to see this realignment. So thank you. Um, I do have a question about the um, having the the path on that side continue, and I was just curious if there was any um, in the preliminary dis discussions about not having that there, or if this was something that has been pushed from an initiative that I'm just not aware of. I was just curious because I do 
I I am as somebody that's going to be using that turn lane to go home um, and just thinking about how sometimes, um, you know, seeing people on the other side, I think it works for Monomoy, but I'm just, I am concerned how it's going to work for Pulpus when, in the summertime. So I'm just. Holly, um, I think Erica has an answer for you. Thank you, Erica. Um, so um, this project originally began as a bike path extension project. Gotcha. That was the that was the impetus for this entire project was to continue the bike path on the northern side of Milestone Road from Monomoy to um, the entrance to the pulpit. You know where the where just past Island Lumber where you go into it. Um, so that people don't have to cross Milestone Road. Um, and so that was the driver. And then, of course, this is a state highway, so we had to bring it to MassDOT with GPI. And GPI wanted, I mean, MassDOT wanted to see this sidewalk, I mean, this intersection improved. Um, and so that's where it kind of, um, these improvements came out of. But the the crosswalk is the driver. This is definitely safer. Let me tell you, with that snow, having to go like this to, to make sure. I'm telling you, I'm I'm all for this. So thank you. Visibility is important. Can I ask one other question? Um, somewhere I saw on the plans that this the the bike path was going to be 15 feet. Is that a standard width for a bike path? Uh, the proposed bike path is going to be 10 feet wide. 10. Okay, and that's the standard. That's the one. Uh, both sides of the road will be the same width. Uh, the one on the south side is actually a little narrower than that. Uh, 10 feet is standard to allow basically this when you anticipate two way traffic, you have, you have bicyclists five feet each, give them some space uh, to get around each other. So why is this one going to be bigger? Uh, I mean, simply we had the space to do something we just felt was just more adequate for the users, especially knowing how utilized this will be over the summer. We're We're also trying to use this standard throughout the town um this is a select board goal to make sure that there is um ability to get around that isn't so car centric um and so when we can install a new bike path at the at the standard of 10 feet we do i'm sure everyone knows the the sake the sconset road bike path is old yeah. um it, th that wasn't the standard at that time um Hillary, your hand has been up for a while. Please go ahead. And then Mickey, I'll call. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I um I I just was hoping that the commissioners could talk about the turning lanes. I think that's the most significant thing. Um, obviously there's safety benefits in the T intersection and it's um, but add, you know, the the road widening um and the multi-lane roads, it's something that will really change the way this this looks. Um, and there is an initiative to get people on bikes. Um, it's a bike lane project. Uh, and we have, we're seeing all across the Commonwealth lanes being taken away from traffic um, because narrower single lane roads are simpler um, and they encourage, uh, you know, we're, we're taking pavement away, we're reducing pavement and preferencing pedestrians and bikes. So I'd let, just love to hear some discussion of that if if the commission's okay with having this uh, this widening of Milestone Road and this um, multi three lane Pulpus Road at this point. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Mickey? So, you know, to Hillary's point to some degree, I was gonna, what I was gonna originally talk about was the choice between this T intersection versus a regular um, roundabout, which we've done at other intersections and sort of curious as to why the, you know, I thought that we had a long time ago, maybe a traffic safety talked about a roundabout in this location. Um, and now it's a T intersection, which, you know, is better than what's there now. But, um, you know, I think what roundabouts do is they really do slow the traffic down and they they slow it down, but keep it flowing. So um, I guess I'm just wondering how the discussion went about the choice between the two different styles of roundabouts or intersections. Um, 
Um, Mike, I saw your hand pop up with that. Mm -hmm. Want to take that? Yeah. Mike, you're muted. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, I was actually going to uh, uh, address that until I got to the point of alternatives analysis, Mickey. Um, and I think Eric might be a better person <laughs> to kind of talk about alternatives analysis. Just to be clear, like a roundabout is the long-term preferred alternative. That's the safest, uh, um, most re re resilient. It, it, it has the reliability of the intersection. Delays are reduced, so it helps congestion, helps safety. Um, uh, and it was the preferred alternative, but it also happens to be a more expensive uh, option with some, I believe, right of way impacts. But I think Eric can probably address that a little bit better than I can. Erica? Me or, 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 or excuse, uh, Eric Reese, I'm sorry. Oh, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> but I can comment on this too after Eric. Okay, um, go ahead. Yeah, as far as a roundabout, it's definitely not off the table long term, as, as Mike just alluded to. Uh, the big thing with this honestly came down to uh, getting this on the TIP and getting funding and wanting to get this path installed as quickly as possible. Uh, so as part of that, uh, we were avoiding any sort of right-of-way impacts. Um, so doing a roundabout, which is we wouldn't be able to do it as quickly through the design and the right-of-way process getting involved, uh, any sort of other permitting that might've been triggered uh, with the larger footprint. Um, so we wanted to at least do something in the interim to be able to build this uh, path extension, but have the crossings be safer than it would if we had left the Y intersection there. Um, so roundabout's not off the table yet. It's something we're kind of looking into an alternatives analysis that we're going to uh, submit to see about a long-term project um, that's still in the works. But that's way farther out. Um, Erica, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things, if I could. Um, Regarding the turning lanes, and I know that in a in a letter previously there was a comment about Richmond and Old South Road, um, and, and look what's happened there. Um, I I drive Old South Road multiple times a day, um, and I really was on the fence about those turning lanes and the median and just the change to that roadway. Um, it is fantastic. It has, it has been a game changer for Old South Road. Um, and I know we, some of us tend to think, myself included, um, about the good old days when we didn't have as much traffic, when we didn't have as much trucks, when we didn't have as much construction. But that's not the reality of the world we live in. Nantucket has changed. We have moved the industrial center of the island off a of milestone road. There's a lot of truck traffic. There's a lot of, um, that's where all the gas companies are. That's where the, you know, the asphalt plant is. And it's a lot of traffic. And to be able to kind of alleviate some of the congestion that comes from all of that is going to be a huge bonus here. Um, I don't think that the turning lanes have been detrimental at all to Old South Road. Um I think that they have really, especially because at the end of Old South Road, that is also an industrial area. And I think unless you live by there and you are driving those roads every day, you don't really have an appreciation for the um, for the impacts that they've made. I mean, I've lived on Nantucket 50 years. I grew up in Sconset. It's hard to see change. Um, but we, this island is busy. Mm -hmm. And make you know trying to not allow this to go through and i'm not saying that's what the nhc is doing but um it, it's really only going to hurt the people that live here work here have to travel on these roadways um a lot of time and effort went into these design plans we have been pretty much working on this non-stop for two years eric maybe if not longer probably um, yeah and and we've you know this has been going to the select board we've had multiple meetings um and and it's so easy to say but this is going to change things well it could change things for the better too and um on a personal note it it um it's tough when somebody says the community this and the community that because it's not 
I, I wish we could all keep our comments to how we ourselves feel because we can't speak for anybody else. Because I know that when somebody says, well, the community thinks this and I'm thinking, well, I'm part of this community and I don't think that. So let's try to keep our comments to our own feelings and our own views and not try to incorporate what the community may or may not feel. Thank you, Erica. Mickey? I'll make it. So just to sort of follow up on the, the turning line discussion, um, you know, I, I, you know, we all know Milestone Road has tons of traffic, you know, to Erica's and, and, and Holly's points. It's, it's, it's a very busy road. I wonder, you know, the Pulpus Road, at the end of Pulpus Road there, there's a, also a turning lane to go left or right. There's, there's two lanes, one to go right, one to go left. I wonder what the justification, and maybe it's there. I'm just curious as to how this came about. Is there enough traffic coming out of Pulpus Road at that point to justify the need for two turning lanes there? Or could that be, could that be simplified as to just a single lane? Um, that's it. I, mean, um, I could talk yeah. to that. If, <laughs> uh, so there, there's two parts to that. One, we're essentially taking, because with the two legs, it almost works as a right turn and a left turn. Uh, so we're, we're taking those two that exist today and essentially consolidating them to one point. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest reasons for the two lanes is actually that the, the primary movement is the right turn. Um, by having the, the left turn lane, it essentially just allows right turners to be able to flow a little better without being stuck behind left turning vehicles is really what it comes down to. If if we have one lane instead of two there, then everyone turning out of there is going to be there a long time um, versus right turners being able to move, only having to worry about uh, traffic that's you know traveling westbound and finding gaps. Um, so if it, it it would cause a lot more backup to have a single lane because Pulpus does have, you know, uh, Milestone has a tremendous amount of traffic. Pulpus has close to half of the, that traffic, which is still a considerable amount. Yeah. So I'm sorry, it's Clement again. Um, or, or you were going to Mickey, I'm sorry. I keep jumping in. Um, Mickey spoke, Eric okay. responded. Clement, go ahead. Well, I, I'm just, once again, this is about signs, but it's also about a, the movement of the traffic. Is there going to be a stop sign there at the end of Pulpus Road for the right-hand turn? I mean, yes. obviously, you have to stop uh, on both lanes. The other thing I think about um, the width, I mean, I understand Hillary's point about this is a double a double wide road, so to speak. But what you're doing is you're, you're taking away the concrete of the off-ramp that we have already had and consolidating it with the other one. So you're not adding more concrete. The concrete is joining together so it feels wider, but you don't have that horrible off-ramp where you're trying to look this way and that way and 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 gauge whether you can sneak out or not. So, I, and I see this happening. You're gonna be addressing this again at, um, you know, going to the airport off Milestone Road. You know that that turn, which is always backed up by traffic, um, and then and then in front of my house, that's the same thing. They're going to pull the off ramp, as they call it. That you, people just zoom around that corner and make it come together and to a. Well, I don't think they're proposing any stop signs for that, but you'll certainly have a better view down Coffin Street uh, to see if anybody's coming or. So I, I think it'll I think it'll definitely slow things down. And that to me is good. It's the same amount of concrete, just rearranged concrete. Well, I mean the the amount that's happening in the triangle off of off of um off the milestone onto the pulpus, there's a bit of a you know, filling in a green space, but the milestone gets wider in a way that hasn't happened on the milestone. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much been a, a, a one lane going each way for for its its whole existence. So this is a it's a, a a relatively major change in the in the character and the feeling of it. Um, and then compound that with the existing bike path and then a wider, um, 
you know, standard now for the North bike path, um, we're really getting into a huge wide swath um, that opens up in this area. I'm not quite sure what's happening in that green area with the to the left, but then all that just makes it feel really wide and open, um, which definitely changes the the character and feeling of it. Um, one of one thing that sticks out in my mind in the the old triangle where the the fork used to go off is um, it's slated to be um, grass uh, and. Um, I think that it would be much more in keeping to have that planted with native uh, vegetation or something to fill that in. We really don't have roads with wide open grass areas um, next to it. Um, and so I feel like that that affects the character. Um, and with the regard to the turning lanes, um, I'm not sure what those little black tick marks are on the milestone, but they almost look like 20 foot lengths. I don't know. Is that what that is, Eric? Uh, those are slotted pavement markers. Okay. I'm kind of picturing the lengths of cars there. So they're like they're. They're about 40 feet apart each. Um, I know so, it's hard to, you can't, it, on this scale, it makes it look like they're even closer. They're about 40, far, uh, 40 feet apart. Um, some were installed with the last project, so they're, they are, they already exist, or shouldn't say were installed. They've, they've been on Milestone Road for a while now, um, having those little, they're little reflectors that are embedded into the pavement. Am I reading that correctly then, that yeah, there might be six cars there, and then, and then the, the cars will have to be stopping behind those um, on the Milestone uh, yeah, that, that, that turn lane is, I believe, 125 feet long. Uh, so, yeah, it, it should be able to hold around five or six cars. Um, some cars could back more into the core area if needed for another car or two. But, yeah, after that. You've would... been working on the island for a while, it sounds like. And you're you're probably familiar when we have gridlock that goes from the rotary to nobody or farm road on, on Old South Road. And then nobody or farm, and then the milestone back um, back to the rotary. Um, so I mean, there are periods where we have congestion, where um, turning lanes really don't matter anywhere. We just have gridlock, and um, no one likes the volume that we have, but we have a lot of volume. And at the end of the day, what are we left with? Um, you know, with with our landscape and our setting, um, with or without. Uh, the, the traffic and the gridlock. And I I live off of Pulpus now. It's been three or four years. Um, and and so I'm th I'm going through this intersection every time I go out. And um, I uh, to me it just it's I I'm I think that there are are great intentions um, here. Um, but I feel like when there's traffic, the traffic is going to be doing what it's going to be doing. And it's it's really what do we have for a setting at the end of the day? And the the old South Road, I honestly don't even I don't even go unless I absolutely have to go to something on Old South Road because it is so uncharacteristic of Nantucket. And not that I want Nantucket to be what you know I found here 40 some odd years ago. Um, change is inevitable, but we do have um, an opportunity to make it um, as sensitive as, uh, as we can to the the setting and and the historic landmark that Nantucket is. So um, those are those are um, my concerns, and I'd like to hear from the the rest of the commissioners. Um, Abby, we haven't heard anything from you, and Rita, if you have anything to to say, please go ahead. Um, I, okay, I'll I'll go. Um, I mean, I do think the the widening of milestone is somewhat of an adverse impact on the um, you know, sort of, and you know, it's. I sorry, I'm looking at a. I printed out this guide to section one of the six review from the um, 
advisory council on historic preservation. So it, it says what is an adverse in, impact and that can be introdu introduction of incompatible visual atmospheric or um, audible elements. And I think we're seeing a bit of that here, but honestly, from my perspective, I think the, the T intersection is, I'm not a civil engineer, obviously, um, but I feel like the T intersection is, will be beneficial here. So I think, you know, we do have to have some trade-offs and I think whatever we can be done to mitigate those adverse impacts of the widening of the road should be done. Um, and that that's really my thoughts. I'm not, I'm, I don't know, I, 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 this does seem to be an improvement from my perspective. Like I think the the intersection as it exists right now is frankly confusing. So and dangerous. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. Hey, Rita, so let me understand you. So I think I think it's unanimous. All of us uh, are are in favor and see the benefits of this changing, like Monomoy did, to a T from a Y. Um, but what you're saying is is that um, as much as that makes sense, um, it also makes sense to to limit the the width of the roads. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. But I I I mean, I think it appears to me that that's sort of what's already been done. You know, I understand the bike path is wider, but that makes sense to me to bring it into what is more standard and to accommodate the the traffic on people, the pedestrian and bicycle traffic um so so yeah so i'm i i uh well i do think there is somewhat of an adverse impact i i also see the the need for it so i that's why i think you know if we can look to mitigating that impact that's what yes. matters is the uh, pulpus bike path the width of the uh, milestone, or is it the wider path that's proposed for on the north side here? Wider. Um, Mike. Yeah, just to uh, the the original uh, milestone path. Well, I, I guess it's it's eight feet wide now, and the existing path. That's that's probably the second or third version of the milestone bike path on the south side of the road. Pulpus bike path was made eight feet wide as well. Uh, that was due to some property and wetland impacts. That was a compromise made with the Conservation Commission back when that was built in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's why that was the compromise there to reduce it down to uh, from 10 feet uh, to, to eight feet. Then uh, that was for environmental impact. Thank you, Mike. Um, Erica, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, just a couple comments. Um, the landscaping, I know, um, Angus, you were worried about having so much kind of lawn, I guess. Um, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not the intent to have like a green manicured lawn there. That's nothing that we as a town can maintain. Um, everything that we've been trying to install now has been low maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a different kind of grass that's allowed to grow that goes like six inches or something like that, that you mow maybe once or twice a year. Um, nothing is supposed, is intended to be, um, you know, high maintenance, green grass, anything, I mean, daffodils. It, it looks like a golf course <laughs> yeah. right now in this plan and that's not the intent. Um, and then with the turning lane and the gridlock, um, my experience with Milestone Road, because I, I take this often too, is that the gridlock going out of town towards Sconset is caused because you've got one or two vehicles trying to turn left and then everyone else is stuck behind them. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, you, the, you know, they'll be, they'll be in their lane. They can turn when they can, but the flow of traffic is going to be able to, to occur in a better way. Oh, on that note, thanks for reminding me, Erica. Um, so when I'm leaving Pulpus Road and headed to Sconset or to the airport or something, and I want to turn left off of Pulpus Road on a milestone, it's only when the traffic has, has um, stopped uh, for people to turn left going from the rotary to Pulpus that gives the opportunity for the people to turn left off of Pulpus onto the milestone headed east. 
So it's kind of a natural break that allows that to happen. Otherwise, I think that would just keep stacking, stacking up on pulpus. Um, yeah. That movement is definitely one that uh, I'm sure is difficult today. And that this project doesn't necessarily address that movement itself um, to, to make that left out of here. Uh, that's where if there was something long term could potentially do more uh, with this project We're kind of limited there uh, to improve it. But as far as the, the one of the things with the turn lane on Milestone Road on the Pulpus Road, I do want to point out with that as far as the safety aspect is um, one crash type that we see all the time is rear end crashes during congestion. Uh, and so a, a lot of it can be if someone is like people might be driving slower, it might be a less severe crash but they do happen when people start to get impatient or not paying attention because they're just stuck in gridlock. Uh, so that is one of one of the intents with that turn lane on milestone is to get them out of the way, just to limit rear end crashes. Uh, and with the that slip lane that's there today, they're also those turning vehicles are able to take that turn a lot faster. Um, mm -hmm. So since they are have we're forcing them to slow down before taking the turn, they need a larger gap in order to actually squeeze through. Um, whereas if you're driving 40 miles an hour, you don't need such a big opening to be able to get through. Um, so some of the, the reasonings for the turn lane uh, and some of the reasons why we didn't, when we did the other two uh, teeing up intersections, we never looked at a turn lane and the traffic didn't necessitate it like pulpus. Um, one thing that comes to mind and, and my concern really is about the widening uh, more than the, you know, easy access or you know shortness of time or speeding up the traffic but but turning left off of uh pulpus onto the milestone um the the visibility of the traffic coming east from the rotary um is often obstructed by the line of traffic headed to the rotary on milestone um and that's not even thinking about a line of traffic in a turning lane that's turning left onto Pulpus from Milestone Road. And my concern would be that you would have to get out in the middle of Milestone Road before you actually see a car racing by all of the turning lane people headed towards Sconset, um, you know, as you're turning left onto the Milestone. So I, you know, just personally, I'm thinking that's going to be that's going to be a, a scary left turn with with a line of cars in the turning lane. Um, commissioners, did, have we lost Abby? Is she not with us? Um, are are there any other are there any other comments on this? Do we want to to um, just express our opinion in a in a letter to? Um, I. Mr. Chair? Yes, Holly. Um, I would recommend um, for the commission to vote on on sending a letter for um, SDOT and, and Eric's uh, team. Um, I did have one question, if that's okay with you. Um, I think it's for Eric. Um, it, this whole discussion about having turn lanes, um, again, as somebody who drives Pulpus Road every day, multiple times a day, been doing it since I got my license, um, I, at 16, um, I, um, understand the turn lane from Pulpus, I mean, from Milestone to get onto Pulpus. The, the, I do have concern on the, the dual turning lanes, one going towards town and one going towards concert. And just thinking about how summertime traffic is going to be and this impatientness, um, and wondering about who has the right of way. Um, if somebody is trying to wait to turn on to Pulpus Road, yet yeah, there's somebody that's also waiting to turn um, left on, uh, to go out towards Sconset. And um, has there been a, a look of just having one turning lane? I understand you're saying about the stacking and concern, but if this was based on obviously data, which I'm assuming it was, um, I would think most of your traffic numbers were from 
going towards town, not necessarily going towards Sconset. And I, and I will say this, I have seen people while I'm in the stop sign to go towards the rotary in you know the current condition, somebody's actually in the other lane um, going, you think that they were going to go towards Sconset, but they're actually there because they want to go towards town <laughs> because for them it's safer. So I do know the numbers have there, there are more of those that happen than people would think. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering if, if having these, again, turning lanes are unique on Nantucket. Um, I would agree with Erica hundred percent at the one on, on, um, Old South Road, yes, it might be different from a character defining feature of Nantucket, but it works um, and it flows, I think. Um, and it's, from my opinion, it seems to be safer, especially if you're wanting to turn to go to UPS, Island Variety, all that, and, and to get back out onto traffic, um, even in summertime. I'm just concerned on having this kind of com competitiveness of two turning lanes wanting to turn at the same time and, and whether or not that's been looked at more. Um. As far as turning at the same time, it's really just them not versus each other per se, but them versus the traffic on Milestone. Milestone Road doesn't have any stop signs. It's you know free flowing. Uh, so someone turning right, they only have to worry about traffic coming uh, from Sconset. They don't, they don't need to look both directions uh, and they can just make the right turn. Whereas left turners have have to look both directions so you could have obviously not saying this is a common problem but you could have no one coming going towards town on milestone road uh, and so right turners could just continuously go and but traffic going towards Sconset it, it has a lot of vehicles and so left turning vehicles are kind of stuck there um, so it's not really that the two turning lanes are competing with each other for when they can go because uh, they're not they're not conflicting movements, so they can go at the same time. It's, it's just whenever they have a gap uh, against the milestone road traffic. Uh, the the length of the, essentially the length of the left turn lane for Pulpus Road was based on some traffic data we've gotten during summer months to try and combat that. Uh, so obviously off, off peak months, the, it might even seem like some of this is is a little long, but it's really going to be for those, you know, Memorial Day to, to Labor Day to ensure that those right turning vehicles don't just get stuck behind um, all these left turning cars, which is, as you said, too, it's not the predominant movement, the right, you know, turning going towards town is by far the predominant movement. Um, so we just don't want those people to suffer unnecessarily waiting there for possibly, you know, minutes when they could have gone a long time ago essentially what it comes down to thank you uh, um kind of on the same note when you're coming for pulpus road and and you've got two lanes instead of one um you know to be able to go left or right are the people going it's the line of the people going left going to make it any safer for the the people um on the bike path um when when the people are turning right um you know just as far as disability if there's just one lane and you go left or right um it, it seems like you have a, a wider sort of perspective of um being able to see the the pedestrians and bikers and so forth um than than having a, a lane beside you that you have to look around um, not just for the bikers, but then the the people coming down Milestone to the Rotary. Is there is there much to look at that? Or uh, I mean, it, it's something to consider. Uh, I mean, you should be, if you're in the left lane, you should have a clear view of the entire crosswalk uh, to be able to see, and you should, as a driver, be paying attention and, and ensuring no one's entering the crosswalk when you go to make your turn. Uh, I mean, the point of this, the consolidating the intersection to one point was to have that one point of crossing, one point of, you know, vehicles interacting with each other, vehicles interacting with bikes and peds. You're a lot more um, attentive if it's just that one point, whereas today there's, I think, technically three different points where vehicles and pedestrians could be interacting. Um, so I think this takes it and just boil it down to one spot. 
Um, I don't know if your question is more geared towards like if, you know, trying to see around a, a vehicle that's turning right. Um, Coming down the Pulpus Road and getting to the intersection at Milestone, I'm just thinking about how much um, visibility and safety is affected by there being two lanes as opposed to one. Um, there, there shouldn't be uh, visibility issues by having two lanes instead of one. Uh, one of the points of creating this more T intersection is to increase the visibility. I mean, today, if you're trying to take a right turn uh, from Pulpus on a milestone, you have to look over your shoulder and can't yep. you know, see very well. Um, with this, it, it's to, for both turning lanes, when you get to the intersection, you can clearly see in, in both directions. Um, again, I, I have no issue with the T. I think that makes all kinds of sense. It's just whether it's necessary to have two two lanes on Pulpus going, you know, to be able to go left and right. Um, Mickey, I see your hand up. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I I mean, I would be happier to see this as just one lane on, on Pulpus Road. I mean, I, I know it's, it's probably going to create some backup from the people that are trying to get left, and that's going to be a struggle no matter what. I just think that this is, you know, it's a lot of pavement. It's kind of a change. We we actually have this bylaw that says we shouldn't have turning lanes. Um, you know, it's a. I think it's a compromise on no matter which way we do this. Um, but I think it's a, you know, in terms of safety, I don't think we're. I don't think one is necessarily any safer than the other. Having two lanes doesn't doesn't make the the crossing any safer. It just makes it flow a little quicker, probably. And as a result, we get more asphalt in a turning lane that some people don't want. So, I mean, that's just my opinion. I think I'd be happier to see it with just the one lane. Um, Mike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, it, it's it seemed like the uh, the left hand turn off a of pulpus on the milestone is kind of a, a thing that's a little sticky right now for a lot of folks. And I'm just looking at, back at you know, all the different traffic counts and studies that we've done over the last couple of decades. I mean, this was originally proposed back in 2004, which GPI, I don't know if Eric was oh, around back then. I, I, I was uh, not, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this was something that was identified then. And, and kind of that same issue was kind of discussed. And if you look at the splits on just uh, the flow of traffic that it's making that turning movement, it's really small. It's it's like a 15% of the traffic, 20% of the traffic, but definitely less than 20% of the traffic on Pulpish Road is making that left-hand turn. Uh, it's not a lot, um, but you would be amazed at the delay that that would create, uh, just inserting those few vehicles into that stream of traffic and the delay and the queuing that that would cause. Uh, I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but Eric is familiar. We have to do air quality calculations and delay uh, when we do uh, alternatives analysis and uh, that would not be a winner uh, if we had to do a, a, a calculation on this uh, to see what the delays are. I mean, again, it's 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 a few vehicles. I'm, I'm saying a few, but it's it's more like you know, 15% uh, of the traffic flow. But not giving them and uh, the ability to separate those vehicles out of that out of that uh, out of that stream, um, it, it would have an incredible impact on overall delay and, and functionality, and it would breed into some of the uh, you know. Road rage is a real thing uh, around the <laughs> island, and there's lots of opportunities where people get frustrated. Uh, and to have that be one more element, al along with the other virtues of delay and air quality, uh, we, we really want to get away from this. I mean, we're speeding and aggressive driving is something that we're really trying to address, and I think this would help that. Uh, and again, these are all compromises that we have to sort through. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the, the roundabout idea would kind of get rid of this concern. It is the long-term vision. Maybe that's a conversation we can have in some future years about reconfiguring this intersection, but it was just, we, we're not, that's not the project being proposed for, we've already covered the reasons. Um, but I would say that this is, this is really a compromise. And I, I think that we found a balance, uh, at least DPI has with doing the alternatives analysis that this is what probably what we could get done now. And it's accommodating everyone who uses the intersection and trying to be respectful of everybody's uh, travel needs and to balance this. And uh, again, cut down the frustration as much as, po much as possible about traveling around the island, whether you're biking or driving uh, and just being respectful of everybody's needs.
Thanks, Mike. Um, about the rotary piece, by doing this now, are we are we really kicking the rotary can down down the road further, or was that um, was that always going to be, you know, a, a distant? Was this is this always supposed to be a two step, or or are we taking a, a one step and moving it further away? to just make it a little bit better now? Uh, th there are a couple of other, uh, milestone corridor itself is something that's it's always gonna be improving, you know, a uh, hundred years from now, there's gonna be something that's gonna be identified as needing to be fixed. Uh, yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize as kicking the can down the road. I would say doing the short term recommendation first, which is this is a short term recommendation. The long term, I don't know if that's 10 years or 20 years, but there are other recommendations along this corridor as well that that probably are higher priorities to be addressed. Uh, the milestone rotary itself, there's the nobody or farm road intersection that's that's a problem. There's the widening of milestone road. It's uh, because, you know, Erica mentioned about the uh, the industrial demands of the roadway. It is, you know, it is a highway that has access to an industrial area with dump trucks and cement trucks using a road where they drive off the pavement uh, onto the, the grass shoulder of the road and you can see the tire ruts. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be addressed. I mean, these are very expensive improvements and I would think that it's been determined that this particular project is what can be implemented now. The other projects are in queue and have been approved and are going to advance in the coming years. And I you know, hope, glad to work with this uh, commission on reviewing the design of those improvements. But I think once all that kind of gets done, maybe we can go back and readdress the improvements that were done here at Pulpus Road, uh, as well as other locations as well. I mean, this is this is a cyclical process where you're constantly, as the community grows, you know, trying to check in to see what the operations are, uh, how's how's the intersection operating, is it worthy of being addressed with the the limited amount of money that we have compared to the array of other intersections that need to be fixed around the island and other uh, improvements that need to be made on the island. So, um, hopefully, that wasn't too long winded, but. Uh, uh, no, uh, thank you for that. And I don't want to get into, into the weeds too far about what's down the road, but you know, literally, what it's is this? I'm not privy to to all the projects that are happening or or on the horizon for Milestone, but if this is deemed necessary for Pulpus Road, you know, at what point is there a proposed turn lane for? Um, for the airport road that, um, you know, uh, nobody or farm road or, you know, any of the other major intersections mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we've, we've made it this far without uh, a turning lane. Is that, is that on the horizon at all? The, yeah, for the, I assume you mean nobody or farm road when you say the airport road, uh, that, that intersection has you know, we, we've we've tried to initiate the project this past summer. That's been approved by MassDOT. We're in the very early stages of doing alternatives analysis for for that intersection. The preferred alternative, again, is the roundabout uh, for air quality, safety, and and other reasons. Uh, um, so we'll see how that goes. I mean, like I said, that's that's a very new project. It's been initiated. The DOT does know that the, the roundabout is the preferred alternative for that. Uh, that's likely to be what advances. Uh, I. I um, I th whether that it gets implemented or not, you know, time will tell about that design process and the planning process that that goes through. Um, but turning lanes could be part of the alternatives analysis. I assume that it will be. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the winner for air quality and safety reasons. Um, but that's, uh, you know, Eric does this all the time for different communities. You go through is that what can we do at this intersection? Uh, is it signalized? Is it roundabout? Is it adding a lane? Whatnot? You do go through that exercise, and you, you do have you know, the, the cream rises to the top, I mean, for a lot of different reasons. And then you go through processes like this, where you just review those preferred alternatives and see and see what happens. So is it a correct uh, assumption to think that when, and it sounds in, inevitable that there will be a, a rotary at the Pulpus Road, that the turning lane would get gotten rid of, it would return to, to two lanes going into the rotary? I'm not sure if I followed that. The two lanes going into the well, road. Would, would we get rid of the the turning lane? It would return to a two lane road going into the to the rotary. Um, when it a rotary could. Implemented. 
it, it, I haven't looked at the analysis for it, uh, but it, it, it could. It, it would have to. You'd have, yeah, you're not going to do a double. Yeah, double I mean, I mean <laughs> okay. That, that would yeah, that would be very difficult to implement. Uh, to have two approach lanes on one side there. Um, but yeah, it it definitely could uh remove the need for multiple lanes in any direction. Okay, um, Hillary. Oh, thank you. Um, so. Um, I wanted to respond to the the comments about um, all of the planning and all of the different scenarios, um, the preferred alternatives, the scenario developments that has happened um, over the past couple of years, and the idea that you know this is a compromise that that um, takes into the balances all of the needs, um, the impact on the visual quality of Nantucket in the historic resource was not balanced. And um, this commission wasn't brought into the discussion at the earliest stages, even though the commission asked to be. And, um, you know, I'm just a member of the public here, but um, I'm interested in the visual quality of Nantucket and maintaining its um, place as a quiet uh, refuge from the rest of the world, um, while also recognizing that, you know, of course, we have to provide amenities and we have to be responsive to the public. Um, but I think that it's just not, um, you know, this this has happened without a seat, a voice of preservation at the table. And that's why we're looking at this. And it seems to be completely baked and going to 100% design um, and out to bid in a week. Um, and, you know, you're asking this commission to just say, well, take historic resources. Well, the commission will have to decide if they feel that this is an adverse impact um, that uh, they should ask to be removed and corrected. I mean, that's up to this commission to decide. But um, you're you're kind of letting them know that this is what you want and this is what they should accept. But I think the question really is, what what does this commission think as far as standards for for roadways on Nantucket, especially historic roads um, like Milestone Road? And that's what I just feel like I'm not saying. And I I I want to defend my comment that the community has expressed an interest in preserving single lane roads, um, not because I think I know everything about the community, but because I think when town meeting, you know, passes an article that's an indicative, not always, but it is indicative of town meeting. And when the community asks for a historical commission, which it didn't always have, but put into place in 2005, they're asking because they want to have a seat at the table of these discussions. So, um, and, you know, a lot of people come and they pay a lot more money for property on Nantucket um, than they would have to otherwise, because it's a historic community that doesn't look like every other place. So um, I just, just wanted to point out that all of these, I feel like we're putting in into a false choice, because um, there was no planning with preservation in mind from the very early stages. Thank you for that, Hillary. Um, Tom, you've been kind of quiet. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, I just want to make a few a, a comment on a couple of things that a few people have said. Uh, one was Erica mentioned that um, have, have the people at GPI uh, accounted for uh, the large trucks that go in and out of island lumber every day like uh, like she said they have you know 40 foot of flatbeds that bring lumber there practically every day is there going to be enough room to make that turn uh for those trucks and going the other way there are a lot of um larger vehicles uh, dump trucks that are hauling long trailers with uh, machines that go down the Pulpus Road. Um, is there enough room to, for them to make the turn right there at that T? And then I think, I don't know if it was Angus or somebody mentioned, when we have the backup in July and August, it's coming down the Sconset Road, headed for the rotary. Mm -hmm. And all those cars are backed up on the right hand side of the Pulpus Road. Are, are the people going to be able to decipher that they can't com completely be bumper to bumper behind each other 
right there at the T where the crosswalk is, preventing someone to turn left to go back to Sconset from the Pulpus Road? I know there's a lot of things there, but uh, you asked for my comments. There they are. Thanks, Tom. Um, Mike or Eric or? Eric so has been raised too. Go ahead. I, I, I would leave on Eric. I assume that, that the returning movement templates applied to the intersection for, for the largest vehicle that would use this intersection, like a, a, a WB60 with a, you know, 18 wheeler with a wheelbase of, of, uh, you know, a good distance. Um, it, we, we did run truck turns wrong? for the, <laughs> we ran truck turns for the intersection. Um, we did we always ensure an emergency vehicle is one thing I know wasn't mentioned, but we always ensure an emergency vehicle can make these turns unimpeded. Um, I believe a WB50 or W40 was a, the largest truck we accommodated where they could easily stay in their own lanes the entire time and make the turns. Um, we also did run a, a very large truck for the house moving, uh, assuming in that case they could take the whole intersection, uh, essentially shut it down to be able to make that turn. So we made sure curb to curb that yep. movements like that could still be made uh, within within the pavement. So all, all of those things were definitely looked at and considered um, an impacted placement of, of curbing, radii, stop bars, and all, all of that. Thanks, Eric. Do, Tom, does that answer your questions? Yep. Um, Erica, your hands up. Thanks. Um, oh my God, I think I've completely forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> 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 um, um i'll 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 try to remember it and i'll get back to it oh i did know what i was going to say um regarding the bylaw and turning lanes um i was just looking up that bylaw which was enacted in 2004 so 20 years ago and think about our population from 2004 to 2024 yeah. Yep. the amount of construction and the amount of people that live here. And I wonder if that bylaw was posed today, would we have the same result? Um, the people who live here year round, who work here year round are greatly impacted by this. I wish it, I felt that it was a quiet refuge for me, but it doesn't always, um, I hate to say, but the people who live here year round have a very different feeling about it than the people that are lucky enough to be able to come here um, vacations or seasonally um this impacts us every single day so that's my comment thanks erica um mr chair could i follow up on that just one just make a, a, a quick ahead, note on the uh, you mentioned the the bylaw and just to, so everyone knows if they're not clear that the uh, the state road is exempt from from that bylaw uh, and we, the, the idea here, at least the, the idea we were pushing forward is like, this was actually reducing pavement from what it is now, the Y intersection and actually reducing a lane of traffic. Um, so that was really the, the, our view, I guess it's, it was actually reducing, uh, lanes and traffic and, uh, the, the milestone road was, uh, you know, it is exempt and there's a heavily following road. So just, just want to just clarify that one little, little point there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We're we're aware it is a state road, um, but we can't help ourselves but to comment um, because it's it's still part of the historic landmark. Um, but also, it's it's Pulpus Road, which is which is also our purview as well. So, anyway, thank you for that comment. Um, before we run out of time for our meeting, we do have a few more things on the agenda, but. Um, would someone like to make a motion for uh, writing a a, um, a letter to DOT uh, with our concerns and comments? Before you do, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question of Eric, which was in the email that I had sent to them, was regarding the area of potential effect APE map. Um, you know, obviously that's something that it's usually done with any section 106 and I was wondering if that map has been created yet and if not if it could be emailed uh let me follow up with uh mass DOT on that I know they awesome. were handling uh 106 for this project yes. um so I'll, I'll follow up 
Thank you. I think that would be very helpful, especially for this commission to opine specifically on the section 106. So if we can get that sooner rather than later, that would be awesome. So thank you. Yep. Um, but so Sorry. I make a motion to, um, to write a letter. I'll make the motion to write a letter on from the Nantucket Historic Commission to the GPI, I guess. Should it go to them? Or well, the they, GOT yeah, or, or both? Or, yeah. um, uh, about our concerns about this intersection. May I ask how quickly this needs to be prepared? It's probably a question for Eric. I was like, um, this, I've, don't want to put a timeline on it. I mean, the, the advertisement date's not for four more months. Okay. Um, I, would, I mean, I think just in general, the sooner the better, uh, but I, it's not like it needs to go out today, per okay. se. <laughs> um, no, but you, you made a presentation um, to, you know, it was all, it, I watched it on YouTube, I guess, or the select board <laughs> in January, yeah, and, and and ask for comments. So I guess we fit into that case where now we're going to make comments. Yeah, no, definitely uh, anything should be directed to Mass DOT as the proponent. Um, they usually will forward it to us at that point, just as the uh, designer on record. But um, we, since we are working on their behalf, you know, anything should technically be addressed to them. Okay, Mr. Chair, is that good enough for a motion? Uh, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Was that you, Rita? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, on your motion, Clement. Yes. And Rita? Hi. Uh, Mickey? Hi. Tom? Hi. Hi as well. Yes. Um, okay. I have one um, question, Angus, before you close the, the window on this, looking at the drawing that's on the screen at the moment, there's this green blob to the south of Milestone Road with a brown spot in it. Can, can somebody describe what that is? <laughs> I, can, attention. I can definitely uh, do that. I, I didn't touch on it too much during like, the public presentation, uh, just because stuff most people probably wouldn't care about. Uh, that is a, uh, a sediment four bay into an infiltration basin. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, for stormwater uh, to kind of somewhat uh, treat the stormwater. Right now, it just runs out of the outfall right into water commission land. So um, we were proposing uh, this setup to be able to infiltrate as much water uh, before it gets in any, into any sort of uh, wellhead protection land. Makes sense to me. <laughs> and will, I mean, will that be sort of a, it looks again like, you know, lawn. <laughs> um, is is there vegetation that is planned to to go over or around or buffer that from the bike path or what? What's the intention there? Uh, with it being an infiltration basin, that there's a certain seed mix, but it would it would just be a certain type of grass seed essentially um, that is uh, meant for infiltration that would go in there. Um, again, just to, to prevent, because right now all the stormwater goes right to a protected wellhead area. Um, so it would be, it would not be any tall vegetation in, in that area. Yeah, um, I want three, three, Mr. Chair, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I'm going on 18 years now in the Lange Planner, this is, these are all the, 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 um, contours going down into the retention ditch, um, if you will. So you're not going to see this visually. It's going to look, you're, it's going to be down. I just want to bring that to this commission's attention. So, I mean, it's, it's not, not it's a depression. It's a, yes, it's not up, it's, a it's dream. down. So, I mean, this is, this is a good thing um, to see this type of stuff, especially for stormwater. Um, and, you know, this is a very important area where, where the water, that's where our, our, Water gets comes from that we drink. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. That yeah, that's that's important to have. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the next piece. Um, Eric, uh, thank you so much for joining Mike Burns and um, and Erica. 
Uh, appreciate your insight in our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Thank being you. here. Thanks. Chair, uh, I got to cut out a little early, but I would like to say that before I do, I approve of the minutes as submitted. And, uh, and um, Mr. Chair, on that note, um, with the um, recommendations um, um, for open meeting law that Erica had sent earlier this week, um, I think that those should be revised. So we'll, I guess, through this, have a request Abby to revise them accordingly. She said she would. So we'll just, um, we'll look to do the approval um, at our next meeting then. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, our, um, while I've got you on here, Tom, I know you've um, e expressed your approval of our report, but I just want to make sure. Um, I don't want to get ahead of our, our goals, and um, but I just want to make sure that if anyone had any comments about the report, I want to get that to the town um, as soon as possible. So, uh, Tom, you didn't you you said you didn't have any yeah, I'm fine. issues with that. Um, while while I've got that um, up, can um, are there any other comments or? Uh, Mr. Chair, sure. I didn't. I didn't get to add or you know send you anything that about this. Um, I know Rita had that, and thank you. Um, uh, highlighted. Um, on. Do you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I it might not be, ben, I mean, bad to include a, a statement about the Warren Sawyer and you know um, applaud the efforts of the Egan um, Maritime Institute for getting all the subject matter experts together and having the the state archaeologist come to the island. It was really beneficial to meet him. Um, I got to go out there and on the site as well. Um, so I mean, I can put a little blurb there, not obviously a large paragraph, but maybe a sentence or two. And I wouldn't mind doing that. And I did also want to mention on that note, I received an email from Mr. David Robinson from the state. Um, I remember briefly telling you all that I he asked me for a letter of recommendation for a NOAA and slash CDM grant that would look at um, all the shipwrecks around the island. Um, and how that comes to not only documenting, um, but also understanding how that um, helps with our coastal resiliency and, and the flow and all that. Anyway, pretty cool. Because um, with that, he, I got an email yesterday that said that he they got it. Um, and, and I will actually be sitting as a, um, like a liaison, you know, if they need assistance Um from time to time. So there's going to be a, a meeting that I'll, I'll be attending on that. So good news. That's pretty cool and exciting. I, I was wondering where that was going. So we can add that in. Um, great. Um, so maybe that's something that we can just um, add add in as that develops. Is yep. that something that you think would happen that you could add in the next few days or? I, well, I'll revise this regarding the Warren Sawyer. I really don't want to opine on on their grant right now. Um, well, speak, yeah, but obviously, as it as it starts to go through process and all that, I will keep the commission up to date. Yes, not a problem. Um, so, as far as filing this with the town, um, <laughs> I don't want to lose all of our. Yep. Work of <laughs> Um, and also, I don't want to have to wait till the next meeting. Correct. Um, Would Mr. Chair, if you're okay with um, me providing the the two, like literally two sentences long, sending it to you all and saying this is how I've added it, and then I'll send it to Erica. That sounds good. Okay. That sounds great. I also um, think because this is supposed to be a reflection of what we did, not what we're going correct. to do. So, can I take? Sentences. Can would someone like to make a motion to approve the? Um, the uh, annual report um, with the caveat that um, Holly will add something um, about the shipwreck at the bottom. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Clement. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mickey. On your motion, Clement? Yeah, aye. And Mickey? Aye. Uh, Rita? Aye. And I as well. Is it just the four of us now? 
Um, okay. Um, so the only thing left um, are our commission goals. Oh. Yeah. I want to pull those up. Well, Abby usually runs that, so. Is there anything on on the list that anyone has questions or concerns, comments about? No. I, I have a comment. Um, I just, I think things would be so much easier if the Historical Commission could be included in some of these super early conversations. And I think we, I think there were, there was a goal about keeping up with section 106 reviews. Um, and I, I guess I would ask if that might be a good goal, if the commissioners would agree it's a good goal to have and get get ahead of some of this stuff. Mr. Chair, um, just on that point, I mean, we, we are, there's different levels and different types of section 106. So I just wanna be clear on that. For instance, you know, Tom represents this commission for section 106 with the wind farms. Just like Diane Coombs represents the HCC, I represent the NPDC. There's ongoing for, with the wind farm discussion. So Section 106 is pretty big, um, you know. And and, and I would, um, you know, say that I would think my colleague um, from any transportation side would let me know if anything's pending, which he's done in the past. So Section 106 would have to be triggered that way. Um, but yeah, to that point, it it is a goal. To make sure we're on top of it, and I, I think I think we are. So, no, I think that's a great goal. But I do remember at the beginning of this, there have been so many discussions about that intersection of pulpus and milestone that perhaps there was, you know, we didn't get a full picture of step one, step two, step three. I think, yeah, I mean, to my to my knowledge, Hillary's point is, can we please make an effort to get in on step one? Yeah, and, and that's. And Angus wrote the letter back in March of last year, and you know they, I mean, the letter didn't come back to this. Again, don't know where it went. I didn't get it, so I don't know <laughs> yeah. what to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do say I will say this: that the that these, if it came from the state, which it didn't, it came from GPI. I think it would have gotten to me, and I have sent. So everybody is aware, and I think the chair and the vice chair is aware of this that I have specifically requested Mass DOT to any other communication that needs to go in the mail about any other project or this project or section 106 that I'm copied on. Good, perfect. That's, That's all I can do. Right, so. so we have that breakdown in communication, but now it's- Correct. Address that. Correct. So, so just as we have a placeholder on, the, on our gold chart here for like, um, you know, historic tax credits, um, it makes sense to have another line for 106 review, and that's just something that's ongoing. And mm -hmm. um, and uh, Mike, no, we don't have uh, Eric any longer, but um, like the intersection at Nobody Our Farm Road and and the Milestone Road, um, you know, as soon as discussions begin with that, um, it would be great to to be involved, um, or at least notified. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Mr. Chair. And uh, Holly's right. We we she's in the, we're in the same office, so it's it's impossible to not. <laughs> it's not that hard to walk over to somebody's uh, desk and and tell them what and talk about what's going on. Uh, just just to be clear, that's a lot of these projects are, are you know nothing's really new. A lot of this stuff's online. We 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 are we have an incredible communication staff that are just uh, very helpful with putting uh, websites together to collect public feedback on all of these projects we, we try to get rigorous without our public input on our long-range planning process the area planning process or all these different traffic studies uh, and the, the, this project was one of those projects that kind of came out of uh, some of these study efforts that we do kind of cycle around the different committees I, you know mickey's on this call mickey we talk about this stuff at traffic safety there's there's plenty of opportunities uh to uh, if something does kind of slip through the cracks like this does, I'm pretty sure people still not kind of know about it and can ask, do we have an opportunity to comment? And MassDOC is being very good about, uh, you know, uh, taking in public comments and addressing all of them. So I, I, I think we're, nothing's perfect, but I think we're doing pretty good uh, and given the ability to, to, to share their comments. And this is a valuable uh, commission as well. So uh, happy to keep continue cooperating as we've done in the past. I appreciate that, Mike. I think... Um... 
as much as it's made it available, uh, just notification to us is really helpful. We all we all have our interests in the things that we're busy, you know, looking through and scanning for and all that, but but notification really puts it on our table. Mr. Chair, I did want to um, also give a, a, an update um, regarding Section 106. Um, today was the, for consulting parties, which we are um, for the South Coast Wind Farm off our coast. Today was a deadline day for comments. Our uh, expert counsel, CHP, sent comments today out. Um, I was able to review the letter before it was sent on behalf of all of us for the town. So um, I did want to mention that that was, that's why we have them. They're the expert in the field. So. Thank you, Holly. Um, all right. If there are no other uh, comments, um, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Um, who, was that Clement again? Moving? Yeah, you know, yeah. Read it, comment. It, it was the it was the duo here. <laughs> For the um, record, Chair, um, that was that was Rita who made the motion and Clement who seconds. On your motion, Rita. Aye. Uh, Clement. Aye. Nikki. Aye. Aye as well. Thank you all so much, and Thank thanks you. again much for showing up. Hope everybody feels better. Yeah, I made it through without blowing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, be well, everyone, and uh, talk soon. Bye. Bye.